This is the Commission Church Online. Welcome to our podcast. We want to be a church who brings heaven on earth through the word of God and the love of Christ. I pray this week's message blesses you. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Sunday service. Amen. It is so good to see all of you guys, everyone joining us in person, as well as everybody joining us online. Welcome. We are so glad that you chose this Sunday to worship with us. And I know that we just celebrated Thanksgiving. So, hey, happy Thanksgiving to you and your family. And you're probably somewhere else. You're probably not even in your house uh, watching as usual. You're probably with uh, another family member. It could be you're traveling, whatever the case may be. Uh, happy Thanksgiving to everybody, every single person uh, watching today. We're so glad that you picked this Sunday to join us in worship. Uh, you know, we're excited about this Sunday morning. And um, uh, let me give you a couple of announcements uh, right before we jump into the word that God has in store for us this morning. Uh, like we say every Sunday, uh, we have an amazing lesson for all the kids after service today. So, hey, parents, if you you are not registered as yet to receive emails from our end. Uh, our C Kids has an amazing ministry. Our our C Kids ministry has a wonderful, talented team of young people that put together some amazing content for all the children in our church. And as we're not meeting in person and the kids are not yet meeting in person, uh, this is an amazing opportunity for your kids uh, to tune in and learn about Jesus. And uh, this week we have an amazing lesson for them. So make sure you're on that mailing list. And if you're not receiving that, you're missing out. Um, And I know the kids team are working hard in a Christmas package and uh, something, a, a big surprise and an amazing uh, package for the kids at Christmas. So before then, uh, definitely sign up, register. It's going to be amazing. Uh, uh, The second thing is we have uh, registrations for in-person services that are open. So make sure that you guys register. The link is going to come up uh, right now uh, in the description below. It's it's right there in the description or in the comments. Uh, make sure that you sign up today to attend one of our in-person services. It's amazing just to come here in person. If you want to bring the kids, we don't have kids ministry here, but if you want to bring the kids, bring them. Uh, even if they make a little bit of noise here and there, it's okay. It just adds to the vibrancy of our service. Uh, Make sure you wear masks just for the protection of everybody here. We would love to see you in service. Um, Man, uh, if you have any prayer needs, definitely reach out to us. You might be here in person. I'd love to pray for you after service. Or if you have any prayer needs and you are not here in service and you're watching online, tune in. Uh, uh, there's, There's a number that's coming up on your screen right now. Text that number. We have a phenomenal, phenomenal prayer team that is so genuine in prayer, and they love praying with people, uh, you know, and I pray that you will join in, uh, text that number. Somebody will reach out to you and let you know that they're, they're praying for you. So do that right now. Do that after service whenever you can. Do that. We'd love to connect with you uh, and pray for you. Uh, man, I, I just want to take a quick moment to remind you about communion, like Janice already reminded us. Towards the end of the service, we'll be taking communion together. This is the last Sunday of the month, uh, right before we jump into December. So don't forget communion. Uh, We are going to be spending time in the presence of God, enjoying communion uh, together as a family uh, of Christ. And uh, what better time to enjoy that than uh, among uh, God's people. So make sure you grab that bread, go to the pantry, grab that juice, whatever juice it is, uh, make sure you grab that. It's just a symbolic representation of what Christ did. So we're going to grab whatever we have, and we are going to share that together. Um, I want to remind you about offering. Uh, you know, uh, every Sunday we, we remind you guys about how important it is to give to the Lord. I don't need to remind this church because this church is such a generous church. We have seen that time and time again. Uh, it, when it comes to generosity, it starts uh, from the very top. We have an amazing board of elders that know the value of generosity. 
uh, whatever the cause is, no matter what it is, the first goal that the, the elders have in mind all the time is to reach out to a community and bless a community that's in need at all times. We find, we find uh, many opportunities to do that, be it um, you know, food pantries in the area uh, that need help right now, uh, be it missionaries that we send across the world. Whatever the case is, we always make it a point to support uh, people that are, in time of, that are in times of need and in times of support. So uh, thank you so much for your generosity and thank you so much for uh, blessing uh, the, 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 the people of the Lord uh, within this Plano area as we reach out to them. Man, it's such a joy uh, to give. So the QR codes are probably on the screen right now. Uh, it's, um, you know, use this opportunity. If you just want to click a link, the link is also in the description. Click that link. Uh, it will take you to a place where you can give online. Make sure uh, that you give. All right. Uh, we just want to pray for you guys right now as we uh, get into a time of, uh, of, of uh, word and studying the word. And I'm excited to share with you a part four of our sermon series titled Miracles. Can't wait. Let me pray for you real quick as you give to the Lord today and as we get prepared for um, this, this message. Father God, would you prepare our hearts as I preach this word that you have put on my heart. God, let this word come alive to us. I pray, God, that this word will be a, 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 a seed that is planted. I pray that this word will, will sprout and it will bear fruit. I pray that this word will do a work in people's lives. There are some people that are needing a miracle today. I pray, God, that, they, that, that this word will come through in power and in might. And God, that your word will transform people. Give me the ability today, God, to be able to take every single word in this scripture and to break it down into manageable and understandable portions for us to understand. So today we thank you. We praise you. We glorify you, and we say, Lord, we love you. We thank you. As people give to you today, I pray that, Lord, that you will bless their generous hearts. And I pray in these coming days that we will see your grace, your glory being manifested in such a beautiful way. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray, and everybody said, amen, amen, amen. Y'all ready for this word this morning, everybody? All right. Let's be a little more excited. You ready for this word? All righty. That's good. That's really good. Thank you so much. And I'm pretty sure everybody at home was screaming too, right? If not, I'm giving you this opportunity right now. Scream on top of your lungs. Everybody at home. Y'all did your part already. All righty. I am excited for part four. Uh, we have been in an amazing sermon series, and we have one more part to go before we begin our, uh, our Christmas series. And uh, man, it's, it's amazing how God speaks to us through the living word of God. And today I pray that this word will come to us in power and in might as we seek the face of the Lord today. Amen. Uh, you know, I want to turn your attention to the second book or the gospel of Mark, the second chapter in the gospel of Mark. Uh, We've been in an amazing series, like I said. Uh, we, we've studied different miracles of Jesus. And for the lack of time, I don't want to go through each of the ones that we've, we've gone over for the, over the last three weeks. But if you have missed at least one of those messages, go back, listen to them. They are powerful and life-changing. And I pray that no matter what miracle that you are hoping for and praying for in your life, I pray that this will be a season of faith. Uh, this will be a season that God lifts us spirits up uh, heavenward so that we will be encouraged to see what God has in store for us, uh, his children. So uh, this evening, I want to title my message, Ten-Legged Faith, Ten-Legged Faith faith, all right? Uh, before your mind wanders, uh, we're going to be studying about the, the miracle where Jesus heals the paralytic man in Mark chapter 2. And not only does Mark chapter 2 talk about it, but the other gospel writers as well talk about this exact same miracle in different other ways. And we'll refer to them here and there uh, in this study. But I want to read this passage for the sake of context. Uh, verse number 1 uh, we're going to go from verse number one, I think, all the way to verse number 11 or 12. Uh, we'll, we'll go to where we stop, all right, where, where time permits us. So uh, here's what the Bible says. Uh, and when he returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. 
And many were gathered. Now, if you're a Bible and highlights person or a note-taking person or a pencil person, pen person, go ahead and underline that word when he was reported that he was at home, at home. Verse 2, and many were gathered together, so there was no more room. Underline that, no more room. Not even at the door. That's important to understand why at the door. We'll talk about that in a second. And he was preaching the word to them. Verse 3, and they came bringing to him a paralytic man uh, carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. Verse 5, and when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic man, son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately Jesus perceived, and they knew their hearts, is what the Bible says, perceiving in his spirit. And they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise, take up your bed and walk? But that you may know the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose and immediately picked up his bed, went out before them, so, all that, uh, so that they all were amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. Right? Amazing uh, scripture. Uh, I know we've read this passage so many times in our life. You've probably uh, done multiple Bible studies on it. You've uh, read about this in the Bible, different versions of it, different accounts of it, as the gospel writers would probably talk to us about. Uh, an amazing miracle where Jesus uh, is in a house ministering. If I have to put it in a nutshell, uh, Jesus has just finished the ministry, gotten off the boat actually, and entered into the house of Simon Peter. And as he's there, people are thronging the house waiting to come and get this miracle from Jesus. Listen from Jesus. This Messiah, they're waiting to receive from him, right? And, and, and if, if it was you and me, we would do anything we can to get a miracle from Jesus. We knew, we knew Jesus isn't down. Man, we will do anything. We'll do anything. We'll skip class. We'll skip work. We'll call in sick. We'll do anything, Right to go into the presence of Jesus and be with Jesus. There were different people. There were people that were expecting a miracle. There were people that were just there to hear about Jesus, hear about the things of Jesus. There were other people sitting over there just judging Jesus, just rolling their eyes. We have different people in church. People come for different reasons. Uh, we have people that come expecting change, expecting miracles. There are other people that just come to just for the sake of coming. It's a religious thing to do. Uh, and we'll study that in just a second. There are other people that will come and they're folding their hands the entire time and they'll just sit and they'll... No, I'm not talking about you, Janice. I, I know it's kind of cold in here. But they're, they're just there. They're, they're cold hearted hearted towards everything that's going on. Uh, there are other people that'll come, and from the time they get in to the time they leave, they're on their mobile phones, right? It's, it's, it's always there. Uh, but they say they're taking notes, so uh, I'm, I'm not judging. I'm, I'm, I'm not judging of you. Uh, and then there are other groups of people that they, as soon as they come in, man, that, the presence of Jesus makes them sleep, right? It's amazing how that happens. They don't sleep at night. They... I'm not complaining, you know? I mean, if the presence of Jesus gives you rest, that's what Jesus said. Come unto me all who are weary and what? He I, I, yeah, heavy laden and I will give you. Yeah, that's what the Bible says. Nah, don't, mis no, don't misinterpret the scriptures, right? But there are different kinds of people that do different things in the presence of God. And there were different kinds of people in this scenario as well, right? And here are these four, group of, four men, crazy men, I call them, that has amazing faith that says, man, we're going to do anything to reach Jesus. And Jesus doesn't rebuke them. Jesus receives them with open arms, right? They make, some, they make this big mess. Verse number one, let's go to verse number one. The Bible says, when he returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home, right? The Bible says uh, when he returns to Capernaum, like I said, he just got, gets off the boat. He arrives in the town and he says he goes home. He probably wanted to rest. He probably wanted to just take a break. But the Bible says that after some days of ministry, he gets home and everybody knew that he was at home. 
It was amazing how that worked, right? But this is the same home that the gospel writers tell us that he was forsaken. It was the same home that the Bible says that the, he came to his people, but his people did not accept him. It was the same home that he was rejected for the things he did. The same home that the people decided to kill him in the temple. But Matthew, in his account, in Matthew chapter 9, when we study this exact scripture, says that he was getting into the boat, Jesus getting into the boat, crossed over to the sea, and he came to his own city. The Bible calls it his own city. He was rejected in his own city for his own people rejected him. This was, this was a city in Galilee. Capernaum was a city in Galilee, uh, which was pretty much his headquarters, right? During his Galilean ministry. It was heard that it was his home. Not his home exactly, but it was, it was the home that, that, that he came back to and it was actually Simon Peter's home that he would come back to and he considered it his own home. And back in the day, even without texting or calls or emails or, you know, text blast or, or group me or whatever it was, people talked like they still do today, right? The, they, they gossiped back in the day. Uh, they, 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 when, when something happened, people just chatted and, and it was person to person. Everybody heard, right, what happened. The news that Jesus was in town spread rapidly and everybody knew about it. When the Bible says he was at home, it undoubtedly refers to uh, Peter's home, which had kind of become a base for operations for Jesus. It had kind of become that place where Jesus came back to the rest, and then he would go back home in his itinerant ministry. He would go here, go there, and then he would come back. And this was his base. This was the place that he would come back to. This was the same place the gospel writers would write in Matthew chapter 4, that this was a land that was filled with darkness. And Jesus walked into it, the land by the sea in Galilee, where Jesus walked into darkness and there was light when there was no light in that city. This was the same city that Jesus was born into, the land by Naphtali and by, 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 by Capernaum. All these cities were close by to each other. Zebulun and Naphtali, the land that was in darkness, saw a great light. That's what the Bible says when Jesus arrived. And this is what Jesus would do in his itinerant ministry. He would keep coming back. And that's what the Bible says, he came back. And in a second, I'll tell you why that's important and why this home is kind of important. In verse number two, this is what the Bible says. And many were gathered, right, together so that there was no more room, not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them. Now think about this. Even before, even before they knew that Jesus was coming, he probably was getting off the boat and they congregated at his home. There's a reason for this. They, They say many people. How many people? We don't know how many people. We don't know that there was, the only thing that we know based on the scriptures, there was so many people that even the door was blocked. There were people in the courtyard, there were people inside the house, there were people inside the bathroom, I'm pretty sure. There was everywhere. There were people and they they were congregating everywhere that there was no place to walk in. Right? Not even at the door. Why was this important? Right, uh, it was important because when you go to Mark chapter one, right, the chapter right before in verse number twenty nine, this is what the Bible says. And immediately he left the synagogue and entered the house of Simon and Andrew. This is the same house that we're talking about with James and John. Now Simon's mother in law lay ill with a fever, and immediately they told him about her. And he came, took her by the hand, lifted her up, and the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening at sundown, they brought to him all who were sick or oppressed by demons, and the whole city were gathered together at the door of Peter's house, right? All because of what? They heard that Peter's mother had fever, and now she was what? Healed. It's amazing how a fever triggered the faith of the masses in order for people to be healed, to know this Jesus. It's amazing when we study this, the accounts of this, how he heals so many who was ill and various diseases even cast out demons. Why? Because they heard that Jesus healed a fever. It's amazing. Because their faith was such that if he can heal a fever, he can heal diseases, he can heal the demon possessed. Are you understanding what I'm saying? It was not the opposite. It was not, oh, he he healed a demon possessed, maybe he can heal my fever. 
That is true faith where he says, man, oh, my, my wrist was hurting. He healed me. Maybe he can heal my cancer. That is faith. Come on, somebody. They didn't have much to go, go off of. The only thing that they could go off of was Peter's mother got healed from a fever. So guess what? If Jesus can heal a fever, come on somebody, some of y'all have experienced miracles in your life that are not worth mentioning. The small miracles, the insignificant miracles. Oh, it was just a fever. But to Jesus, he looks at you and me and says, a fever is still a fever. I conquer sickness. I conquer disease. No matter what you went through in your life, remember no matter how insignificant it is, It is probably a thing that Jesus will hinge on for the rest of his ministry. That's probably one thing that somebody else's faith is going to build on because you had a fever, because you had a wrist pain, because you had a breakup, because your heart was broken, because you went through something very insignificant for you. But your testimony, and because what you are about to say through what you went through is probably going to be a crucible. It's probably going to be a reason why so many other people are probably going to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. A fever ignited a fire. And that's what I want to urge you with today. Don't let a big miracle cause you to believe for smaller miracles. Let the smaller miracles that you have faced ever since you were a child You remember all those little miracles. If I have to ask you to pause, take a moment and think back on all those times God saved you from all the things that you were going through. Your family almost didn't make it. That that car accident, Jasmine, was about to kill you. But man, God saved you from that. Your car took a beating. You probably might be one car shot short, but it does not matter. Come on, somebody. You better understand this. But your life was saved. That is a miracle for you to stand on and say, if he did it yesterday, what makes me think for a second that he can't take care of this issue that I'm going to take care of tomorrow. He's using that as a platform for him to perform something bigger. But here's the beautiful thing. No matter what house Jesus walked into, he would fill it. He fills the house when he comes in. The Bible says there was no room. That's what the Bible says. That's the amazing thing about the presence of Jesus. You don't need worldly entertainment where Jesus' presence is. That's what a lot of churches do, Jer. That's what a lot of churches do. They feel the need to introduce things of the world in order for people to come and people to attend. The agendas are filled up with stuff and less of Jesus because churches want to be filled. But let me tell you something. Where the presence of Jesus is evident... You don't need smoke machines and lights and you don't need fancy stuff. You don't need crazy, crazy things in order to draw people into the church. The presence of the Holy Spirit and the presence of Jesus should do that. It should bring people in, not the social media, not the fancy stuff, not the good looks of people, not the skinny jeans, not the good looking people at the door. All that is great. All that is wonderful. But what brings brings people in is Jesus. Let's never forget that as a church. We will always, we have always, we will always, and we will continue to always put Jesus at the center of everything we do, everything we preach in Commission Church, because without Jesus, we're nothing. Where Jesus is, the place will automatically fill, man. When the glory came into the temple, it filled the house. Nothing else was needed. The glory of God, when it came into the tabernacle, that was all that was needed for miracles, signs, and wonders. That was all that was needed for the remission of sins. That was all that was needed for people to meet with God when the glory of God fell down. We don't need to do extra stuff. We don't need to come with the bells and the whistles. All that is great. They're just tools for ministry, church. But we don't need that for souls to be saved. So the Bible says there was no room. That's amazing because I pray that in your hearts, is it so saturated with Jesus today? Is the room of your heart so filled with Jesus today that there is no room for anything else? I pray that your house will be just like that where when Jesus walks in, 
The presence of Jesus will fill that place. The presence of Jesus will pack your heart to where there is no room for anything else to enter. Right? It's powerful when we think about it because it's important because the, the fullness of the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, when they work in tandem, can surely fill up every desire and longing of the heart. Fill your heart with the fullness of God. Right? Verse number three. This is what the Bible says. And they came, bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. Right? Let's pause there for a second. There's a continuation of there. Uh, but let's pause there for a second. Paralytics, or a paralytic, is one who is lame. Like literally in the sense of the word. It's, it's a one who is crippled or paralyzed. Disabled or weak of the limb. That's who a paralytic was. A paralytic was usually crippled in their feet and their legs, you know, and they were unable to walk. They had a physical disability that, that caused them to not walk. And some of them were paralytic from birth. We, we, we learned about a lame man like that a few Sundays ago. You know, in the early uh, 1900s, uh, 1930, 1940, uh, th- there, was this, there was this disease that crippled people. One of the most feared diseases and illnesses was polio. A lot of you probably heard about it. Often it was referred to as infantile paralysis. Because most of them that was most of the people that were affected by polio were actually children, infants. And in ancient times, uh, you know, paralysis was viewed as as permanent and a hopeless condition. We don't know if this man had some kind of version of that and he was paralyzed from birth. And back, if you think about the 1950s, before a preventative vaccine was developed in the mid-1950s, some, around some 20,000 people were paralyzed by polio. And about 1,000 of them died from it each year in the United States alone, right? And, and, and in ancient times, right, paralysis was viewed as permanent, a hopeless condition. We have a vaccine for it now, but, when, but, but back in the day, people thought if you had paralysis, that was it. That was your life. You were, you were carried everywhere. You were taken everywhere. And in most, unlike uh, people that had leprosy, they were, not like, they, they were not discarded by society. People would still accept them. But people would think that it was some kind of sin, like we studied already about the lame man. It was some kind of sin that was associated with their paralysis. It was a hopeless condition that they were in. But in comes four Friends. Crazy friends, like I would like to call them, who believed that Jesus had the answer to an impossible situation in their lives. And while Jesus was teaching in Capernaum, they seized the occasion and they said, everybody is running over here. Maybe we can take our friend to see Jesus. Man, I need some friends over here, some crazy friends that care about people that are not close to Jesus. Some people in here that can look at friends around you who are perishing, who are walking away from the Lord and have a desire inside of them to meet Jesus. Here are four men. We don't know what their background is. We don't know if they are are saved, if they are washed in the blood of Jesus. We don't know any of that. If if they've witnessed salvation, we don't know anything of that. But all they heard was Jesus was in town and they wanted to bring him Warren Wiersbe actually talks about the characteristics of these four men. And they say, and he says that, the, you know, they, were, they had these qualities of fishers of men. Because for one thing, they were deeply concerned about their friend. And they, they really wanted him helped and wanted to see him helped. They had faith to believe that Jesus could, could, could heal him and could meet the need that he had. And that was the case, right? They, they didn't simply do what many of us do today. What do we do? If somebody is not well, what do we do? We'll pray for you, right? You are in our thoughts and prayers, right? We are with you in spirit. What are the things that the churchy things that we have to say when somebody is not well? Folded hands emoji, <laughs> raised hands emoji, crying emoji, right? What is that? Halo emoji, right? All the emojis are what sends prayers to people. That's not what the four men did. The four men didn't say, hey, I'm going to go to, uh, to the prayer meeting and I'll pray for you. Jesus is there. No, no, no. They said, bro, you need healing. We're taking you with us. 
They said, I don't know if you've heard about this, Jesus, but if there's anybody that can take you out of this situation, we're, we're tired of having to carry you everywhere we go. We're tired of carrying you to the restaurant. We're tired of doing this. We're tired of, we want to see you walk. They had this ad, 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 admirable faith, if you ask me. They didn't just say, we'll pray about it, but they put some feet to their prayers. It's important to put some feet to your prayers sometimes. It's important to put your faith to action sometimes. They did not allow, they, they did not permit the difficult circumstances to discourage them. They didn't look at the house that they were going to, and they, they, didn't, they didn't say, oh man, it's probably going to be difficult to get in there, right? Like, think about it for a second. There's something that I want to remind you today. Life's biggest miracles are not always obvious. They're not always in your face. They don't come to you in the most obvious of circumstances. They're not just given to you. Sometimes it's not as easy as that. It's disappointing when these four men are bringing their friend and there's no space in the main sanctuary. They can't get to where Jesus, they can't get to the action. They're like, okay, let's, let's try the courtyard and they try another entrance probably. They're like, well, overflow is also full. You got to go watch the live stream, bro. Sorry. Now, here's what could have happened, right? If they, were sub if they subscribed, right? Or if they were subjected to the theology of it might be a sign. Aren't we always sometimes like that? When we see closed doors, we're like, that's a sign. That's a sign. Let's just go back. I'm guilty of that. If they were subscribed to the theology that it's not God's will for you to be healed, that's why the door is closed. Come on, somebody. They would have gone back home without a miracle. So many of us miss miracles because we take signs and we take closed doors as God saying no to us. But sometimes one closed door is an opportunity for you to look for a ladder so lying somewhere close by and saying, no, 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 I'm going to do whatever it takes to press in, to go the extra mile, to knock on the door, to see if I can reach Jesus. I'm not going to let my circumstances, I'm not going to let my physical circumstances, I'm not going to let my, my situational circumstances allow me from stopping to meet this Jesus that can only give me my miracle and my, 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 my healing and my deliverance. Sometimes the obvious doors are not the doorway to your miracle. Come on, somebody. I went and prayed with pastor. I, I, I wasn't healed. Sometimes that might be the most obvious. I prayed. I called the number on the screen. Nothing happened. I fasted for 21 days, pastor. Nothing happened. Sometimes what you think is the doorway to your miracle is probably not the doorway to your miracle. God has something else in store. And unless you go knocking around, unless you go looking for other opportunities, man, you might go to three windows, you might go to three doors, and you're like, man, nothing works. And God's like, man, you just need to keep praying. You just need to keep knocking. It's about the pursuit. Knock and it shall be open. Keep knocking. If it's not open, keep knocking till God looks at you and says, it's your time. Some of you have quit knocking. Some of you have quit looking for, for, for God to, for, for open doors. And every time you see a closed door, you're like, ah, not, a, not my time. Oh, not, not, not this time. God's like, sometimes you just got to go that extra mile, right? Sometimes we chase the most obvious door expecting a miracle. Sometimes we go to the front door and it's closed and we're like, all right, let's keep going to the front door. Let's keep going to the front door. Let's keep going to the front door. But every single time you go to the front door, there's a bouncer standing right there saying, nope, sorry, can't come in can't come in. But if you have the will and you say, uh-uh, I got dressed up. I'm about to go into this party. You ain't about to stop me. You're going to find another entrance. You're going to find somebody that's good. Are you understanding what I'm saying? If there, if there is a will, if there is a desire, if there is a thirst inside of you, there are these men that are looking at the situation and saying, no, we ain't going to give up. There's, about, there's a miracle that's about to happen. Happen, I'm sorry, but I'm, I'm encouraging some people today. God is looking at some people to, 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 to go the extra mile. And if that's you today, I'm asking you, would you work together? Would you come together? Would you make up your mind to say, man, I got to do anything. And here are four men who worked together and dared to do something different. And Jesus rewards them for their efforts. How easy it would have been for them to say, well, there's no sense in trying to get to Jesus today. Maybe we can come back tomorrow. Oh, he's come to rest. Maybe we can come back tomorrow when there's no rush. Maybe we can come back tomorrow. 
You know, when someone you know is probably facing this serious physical difficulty or spiritual crisis, it's your privilege, it's your duty to join together in prayer. It's our duty as a church to join together in prayer, bringing our friends to Jesus, the only one who can meet their deepest and their most desperate needs. Are there people in your life that you know that need Jesus more than anything in their life right now? Do everything in your power. Invite them once, invite them twice, invite them three times. They may say no. They may say, yeah, I'm coming, and they may bail you on you a last second the third time you might try and they say oh, they're, they're, they're coming you know they're coming they're texting you that they're getting ready and man halfway into service you get a text saying oh man my car broke down but don't be discouraged you don't know what happened try the fourth time do everything in your power to bring somebody that has not witnessed Jesus and has not had a rendezvous with Jesus try everything in your capacity to bring them to the feet of Jesus because man guess what a miracle is waiting for them. In verse number four, what does the Bible say? The verse number four, it says this. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. This is some good stuff, y'all. This is what I, I, I need us to understand today. The Bible says, man, when they couldn't get near him because of the crowd, Let me read you uh, the the version in Luke. Luke talks about this differently and he says, they were trying to bring him in and to set him down in front of him, but not finding any way to bring him in because of the crowd, right? You know, it's beautiful how how the different gospel writers talk about this, right? Uh, In in Mark chapter 2 and verse 2, the Bible says this. It says, there was no longer room, not even near the door. It's important for us to understand. The house must have been, uh, you know, one of those olden uh, first century homes uh, of, of Galilee back in the day where, uh, man, it was the house of Simon Peter, which was not a rich home. Most of the rich homes would probably have two floors and two stories. But this house, like many other houses, might have had a stairway. And I'll tell you why they would have had a stairway. They would have probably had a stairway. The rich homes would have two, 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 uh, two floors to it. And the stairway would probably be from inside or the outside. But most of the homes had a stairway leading to the upstairs. And the reason they would do that is to access their roof. And I would tell you in just a second, but they had this outside stairway that would allow them to get a, a, a man on the roof because they would have to service the roof very often. Some of them uh, put stuff on the roof, right? Um, and, and imagine the scene, right? Imagine this, this, this scenario. And Luke says Jesus was teaching. And all of a sudden, the rafters start shaking. Think about that for a second. And I know how it is when the roofers get on my roof. We had some uh, Christmas light installers come to our house and install some lights and they just got into the roof and it was thump, 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 thump. I was like, man, what is going on? Is this an earthquake, right? And I want, to, I want to describe to you in just a few seconds as to what that roof was and how that would have been crazy that they did what they did. All of a sudden, the rafters are shaking. There's this huge earthquake that's taking place. The New Living Translation actually says this. It says they couldn't bring him to Jesus because of the crowd, so they dug a hole through the roof above his head. Now, don't miss this. What is Jesus doing? Jesus is what? Teaching. Someone say teaching. Jesus is in the middle of preaching his message. When suddenly, what he hears is this thump, 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 and he's hearing like people clawing and, and, and poking through and probing and, and hitting the, the roof and the tiles are being taken off and people are probably distracted and Jesus is probably distracted. Like, think about all the destruction, the dis, not destruction, the distractions that could ever happen during a service, right? What are some of the distractions that you know of? Cell phone ringing, right? Uh, Kids crying, right? People sleeping in the front row, right? I, I, it was funny because I actually asked, um, uh, I asked a group of my pastor friends uh, in one of the groups that I'm on, I said, hey, I, I need your help. Tell me what exactly was your, your biggest, um, you know, um, what do you call it, um, the uh, distraction when you were preaching. And this is what, this is what one guy said. He said, for me, it was when the chairman of the board took a cup of dip, uh, took a can of dip 
out of his pocket right in the middle row. He proceeded to thump it a few times, opened the can, took out a large dip, put it into his mouth, and he licked his fingers, closed the can, wiped his fingers on the pants. And my pastor friend is sitting on the stage looking right at his elder doing that. Any elders in the house today? Whoop, whoop, Jerry. (laughs) I've never seen Jerry do that. Don't worry. Should I go on with his list? All my pastor friends went crazy with this. No, let me stop there. <laughs> I li- I'll tell you one of my biggest distractions. I remember, I, this was not in our church, trust me. This was uh, back when I was itinerating. Sonia and I were talking about, Sonia was talking last week about how, uh, you know, when we were itinerating, we used to travel a lot. There was this kid that was sitting on the front row who literally picked his nose, picked out all the boobs. He had his Bible, right? And I'm, I'm watching this entire thing unfold. He... <laughs> This dude, he, he picks his nose, like every part of his nose. I think he went even deeper to find boogers that were not even in his nose. He goes so deep. <laughs> I kid you not, he picks out every booger from his nose and he draws a heart shape on his Bible with all the boogers. Okay? And to make it worse, and I'm sitting over here and I'm, I'm preaching about Jesus and the love of Jesus, right? And, and I'm so distracted at this point. And to make things worse... This little boy does this. After he's done, he smiles at it and he says, <laughs> let me tell you something. That day I wanted to quit preaching. I kid you not. Talk about distractions. Jesus is preaching a serious word. And all of a sudden, come on somebody. Why is this important? Because this was not a, let's take this gentle. Let's be very gentle. Jesus is preaching. Let's be as quiet as we can. Let's, let's make sure that, you know, uh, thing, let's make sure that he's not disrupted in this. No, 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 no. The Bible literally says, the New Living Translation literally translates it from the Greek and says, they dug a hole through the roof above his head. They chose the exact point. I don't know how they knew Jesus was right there. It says right above his head, right? They went digging. And the word that's used in the Greek is literally, it literally means to gouge one's eye out. All right? That's the action verb used over there, to literally dig, to gouge one's eye. So, okay, why is this important? Right? Why is this important? Let me tell you why. It's so graphic, but yet it's true, right? Because Here's a modern day roof, right? If we have to take shingles off a modern day roof or a a, a tile, we would detile it or we would de-shingle it. We would take the shingles off. They would would knock it out. But back in the day, right, an oriental roof or a, a Middle Eastern roof would have to be dug, right, to make an opening as was required. That's why it's so important to understand that. Why? Because the roof was made out of these materials. It was a composition of mortar. It was a composition of tar, uh, ashes, and sand. They would put all of this together. Now, for those of y'all who don't know, I, I just found out about this last week. And one of my, I love barbecuing. And I found, about, found out about this. Someone said, don't waste your ashes. I usually, what I do is I, once the ashes are like um, cooled out, I take it and I throw it away. And someone said, hey, don't waste your ashes. You can actually use it. If, you, if ash hardens and it's mixed with water, it could, they make concrete out of ash. I don't know how many of you all knew that, but if you go to their concrete mix and, and Google as to how they make concrete, ash is mixed in it, right? So, uh, and some people said if you distribute ash, ash or throw ash around your house, around the foundation, ants won't come into your house. It's crazy. Different, different things that, we've, uh, that I've heard um, over the last few weeks, but uh, it's crazy because this ash would allow them to make cement. It would allow them to make a material that's really hard. And what would happen is they would roll it and they would, they, they, they would roll it hard. And just because of the composition, sometimes grass would even grow on top, of the, on top of the roof. And they had to have a stairway going up because they would have somebody on a roller that would actually go and roll out the roof from time to time. Every time it got wet, they would have to roll it out to make sure that it held its integrity and its strength. So... It, and, and I'm going to throw up a picture real quick, and they're going to throw up the picture on the live stream as well. If you look at this picture, this picture should uh, describe a first century house, if you can actually see it. Uh, <clears throat> there's a stairway that goes up, and, and the, the, you know, the, there's this one bedroom. It, it's, it's mostly one room, 
right? If you think about it. Go to the next picture. Uh, it will give you more of an understanding. Now, this picture at the bottom, uh, you see the Israelite home was around 24 by 24. It was, a, it was a box. It was a square box, literally 24 feet by 24. In comparison, if you look at a double-wide mobile home of today, it's around 24 by 60, right? So it was even bigger than an actual trailer home or a mobile home that's in a trailer park. So think about it. It's that small, right? And if you look at the top, they would, they would uh, I know some of you all sitting here can't see it, but if you're watching online, you could probably see it. There are these wooden roof slats and the, the, the straw-covered roof on top. And literally, the straw-covered roof was made out of materials. And, and some of them, if they could afford it, they had tiles that were put in between. And this mortar, this mix that I just told you about, was put in between. So... So this is the situation because in Luke 5.19, the same story, the Bible says, it says they, lay, they let him down through the tiles. So in this house, they had tiles as well as this mortar. That's where the Bible says they had to dig right through. So think about it for a second. They just couldn't take the tiles off. They had to literally claw in. They had to gouge. That, I don't know if they brought tools or what they did, but it was a loud ruckus. Right? This is important to understand because, you know, for them to not only take the tiles off, but they had to dig through the grass and the earth that was surrounding him. They had to pry up the tiles and they were willing to do anything. They were willing to get their fingers dirty. They were willing to get their hands dirty. They were willing to put their efforts into this to make sure that their friend gets to see Jesus. But why are you making all the noise that you're making? It doesn't matter. I want to meet Jesus. Some of y'all, man, y'all worship, and I love the way some some people worship in church. They forget about who's standing next to them. Some of y'all cry when y'all worship. Some of y'all, you know, just shout out when you worship. Only you know. The Bible says David danced when he worshiped. People mocked him. His own wife looked at him and said, why do you do that? You're a king. You have, uh, you're esteemed. People look up to you. You're not supposed to do that. But David's like, man, before I was a king, I was a shepherd. A lot of people know that you know how to worship. And no matter who it is, you don't allow circumstances to come in between your noise to the Lord. Don't let that affect your relationship with God. You make as much as noise you want. Verse number five, this is what the Bible says. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic son, your sons are forgiven. The Bible says their faith. Someone say there. Now this is the amazing thing that I want to talk about today. When he says their faith, he's talking talking about all of their faith. It was just not the four men. He seems to be talking about all five men. In Mark chapter 2 and verse 3, the Bible says the four men carried the paralyzed man. Not only does Jesus see their faith, but he also sees the greater need in the situation. He sees that they all had confidence in the power and the willingness of Jesus to heal this desperate case. We've got to understand this. This was a ten-legged faith. This was just not an eight-legged faith. This was a ten-legged faith. There were ten legs that were involved in that faith equation on that day. Even though four, there were four men, there were eight legs that walked into the room expecting a miracle physically. There were ten legs that were believing and expecting a miracle. And how did they believe? They believed because of a fever. They believed because they heard that somebody had a fever and now they were healed. They believed because a demon-possessed man was healed as a result of being healed from the fever. They believed because something happened before. The two legs that did not walk in, that did not walk in physically, also believed. He also believed. He didn't protest in in embarrassment. He was not there saying, guys, what are y'all doing to me? What's going on over here? We don't see one mention of this man protesting and saying, no, I don't want this. 
I've heard a lot of preachers saying, man, he, he didn't want to come. So they just picked him up from his, from, from, on his bed. They didn't, want, they didn't even bother to carry him. They just picked him up, picked his own whole bed, and they brought him in. And they just, they just forced him in. No, 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 no. That's not what's mentioned over here. There is no protest. There is no, God, save me of this embarrassment. Not a word is uttered by the paralytic or his friends. It's important to understand here, more eloquent than words is the prostrate form lowered through the ceiling to the feet of Jesus and interrupting his teaching in this packed house. The act of faith, the sheer audacity of faith. You got to understand this. There is no, there is no quorum there is no proper way when it comes to addressing Jesus. You do not interrupt Jesus. Jesus is all yours. Jairus, is, Jairus knew that. He said, man, I know you're attending to one miracle, but man, I know that you don't mind me interrupting you. Jesus will take any interruption and say it doesn't matter. The, this miracle that we're about to see would be greater than the physical healings that, that, that they had seen Jesus perform. This would be bigger and greater than any of them have ever witnessed so far because this miracle would also result in a second miracle that was about to happen. The miracle that Jesus really wanted to see in this man. What am I talking about? Right? Right? What I'm talking about is the greatest need of this paralyzed man. The greatest need that all of us have as paralyzed men and women. The greatest need that, that, that the paralyzed men and women of our age have. The, since the fall of Adam, we're all crippled. We're all paralyzed in desperate need of Jesus Christ. Here's a man who Jesus looks at and says, man, more than your physical ailment, I care about your spiritual ailment. It's amazing in a few verses how we're going to see Jesus address his situation. Do you know that forgiveness is both man's greatest need and God's most important gift? And because of that, forgiveness and salvation is what Jesus will put above your physical healing and everything else. He values that you know him before you experience anything else that is from him. Jesus wanted to make sure he, he reiterated his real mission on earth and that, and, and, and that real mission on earth was that he had to make the spiritually dead alive again. It's amazing when we start studying this passage, y'all. You know, when, when someone we know is facing serious physical difficulty or a spiritual crisis, it's our privilege to join together in prayer. I said this. It's our duty to bring our friends to Jesus because, man, the only one who can meet their deepest needs is Jesus. And it's your and my responsibility as Christians, as believers, to bring that to people's attention. There's a man called Jairus, like we learned a few weeks ago, who said, man, I need to bring Jesus to my daughter. There's a little girl in the Old Testament that saw her master suffer from leprosy and said, man, I want Jesus to meet my boss. You remember Jesus throwing back the healing of the demonic boy who, uh, who under the faith of his father, the father brings this boy that's demon possessed. And Jesus heals him no matter what your desire is for someone to see Jesus and to meet Jesus. I pray that today you will have the desire like those four crazy men who said no matter what the circumstance, I want people to meet Jesus. You know how encouraged I am when I get text messages from you saying, hey, my friend is tuning in today. My friend is attending service today. They walked away from Jesus. Hey, pray for me. I'm witnessing to my friend at work. Hey, pray for me. I have a Muslim friend. I have a Hindu friend that I'm praying for. Man, it encourages me so much when you guys tell me about the witnessing that you do in your lives. They are not going to hear it. I do not think, that's a crazy thing, I do not think Christians exercise enough of this power, this power that they have to bring people to Jesus. You have no idea the amount of authority and power that you have in saying, hey, I know a Jesus that can heal you. I know a Jesus that can fill every void in your heart. 
You know, there are so many Christians that are so busy with faith about their troubles, faith about their sins, faith about their personal experiences, that they have no time to exercise that faith for another person that they know needs Jesus. Stop being so self-obsessed and self self you know, inundated with the things in your life and the faith that you need to heal your own situation. We can get caught up in that and forget our mission. We're commissioned church. We ought to take the gospel of Jesus Christ out there. This sick man was brought by four. He was brought and could not have reached Jesus without their help. Do you know there are so many people that you know that will not and cannot reach Jesus without your help? Trust me, a lot of them might, might object. Some of them might be okay with it. But what are you going to do? Man, paral- paralysis is not as painful as cancer. It's not as loathsome. It's not as objected to as le- leprosy. It's not as fatal as cholera or COVID-19, but it's a disease which renders the patient eminently helpless. And here's a helpless man. Do you know that the world is helpless without Jesus? The world is paralyzed without Jesus and the world is desperate need for some friends like you and me to go to their rescue and say, you need Jesus. Do not be embarrassed to look at somebody and say, you need Jesus. You need what I have. There are persons that are affected with spiritual palsy, spiritual paralysis who will never fall into, gra- never fall into glaring sins. And you know what? They will remain inert and without the power of religious decision. They, they will stay away from it. They will run away from it. They will not make that decision. And if you just expect to sit there and say, man, God's time, they will turn to Jesus when the right time comes. If you just sit there and wait for that time, man, God's looking at some of us and saying, you're not being a friend. You're not being a Christian friend. It is the mission of the church. And I'm, I'm commissioning some of you guys today as you're listening to me. It is the mission of the church to bring to Christ those who are helpless in spiritual indifference to seek Him on their own accord. Some people will not make that decision and cannot make that decision. I pray that you will be the difference in their situation. And in verse number six, as we go on, this is why it's important. The Bible says this. Now, some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, right? Verse five, let's go to verse five again. Verse five says, and Jesus saw their faith. He said to the paralytic, sons, your sins are forgiven. That's what he said. He said, son, your sins are forgiven. For Jesus, that was bigger, bigger to him than the physical healing, right? We're not even talking about the, the, the physical healing as yet. Think about it for a second. These four men are coming expecting what? A physical healing, right? Timmy, one of them, is looking at Billy and saying, Billy, uh, didn't you say we were bringing him here for physical healing? Uh, Billy goes, yeah. And, and Timmy says, did you hear what Jesus just said? And, and, and Billy goes, yeah, yeah, I, he said something about sin and that he's, he's forgiving him of his sins. And Timmy was like, man, is that why we came? And he was like, no, well, we came so that he can heal him. I don't know what's going on over here. But Jesus really cares about something else. And we're going to talk about that in just a second. In verse number six, as soon as Jesus says, your sins are forgiven. Okay, here's what happens. The scribes and the Pharisees they were sitting there questioning in their house. These scribes and the Pharisees were, were there to just cause trouble. Like I said, there were different kinds of people over there trying to listen to Jesus. There were people that were genuinely interested, people that were expecting a miracle, people that were there to listen to the word. And then there were people that were just there to judge, to pick the flaws of the teaching and the conduct of Jesus, right? Because they were jealous of his popularity. And his power had aroused that jealousy because it was taking people away from the temple and Jesus was drawing crowds and they were not drawing crowds. Who were the, who were the people, the scribes? They were, they were people that were skilled in Jewish law, in theology. They were scholars. They were experts of the law. And, and, and when they should have been praising God in their hearts, 
knowing that a sinner has been saved. Here are these people who, 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 who did not verbalize that critical judgment, but the Bible says they think it in their hearts. They think it in their minds, right? But thoughts are important, y'all. Because the heart is the essence of who we are and what kind of person we are. It's important to understand that. There are so many of us just like those scribes, right? We praise with our lips, but we disbelieve with our hearts. We come on Sunday mornings and we sing praises. God of miracles. You were, you are, you are. To, Lord, I believe, Lord, that you are all powerful. We, we proclaim with our lips. But man, when the rubber hits the road, it's all a different story altogether. In our minds, we doubt him. In our hearts, we doubt him. We are scribes and know that the word, that we know the word. We know the Bible, just like the scribes did. They were scholars in the word. So many, so many of us, we know the word inside out, y'all. But we disbelieve with our hearts. You know, in Psalms 23 and verse 7, the Bible says, as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. That's what the Bible says. In, in Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 23, the Bible says, watch over your heart with all diligence, for from it flows the springs of life. The Bible says they were just murmuring away in their hearts. Right? Verse number 7, what does the Bible say? The verse number 7, it says this. It says, why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Now they're still thinking in their heads. How do we know this? In a second, we'll find out. How does Mark know this and why is he writing this? We'll, we'll, we'll talk about that in just a second. But instead of joy in their hearts, there was judgment in the hearts of these legalistic leaders. Notice that derogatory reference to Jesus as a man. They're like, this man! When others were calling him rabbi and others were calling him Jesus, uh, Messiah, son of God, they were like, this man, right? They had a problem with him. They had a problem with Jesus saving and forgiving sins. They didn't have a problem with him healing. Their problem with him was that he forgave people's sins. They didn't have a problem with what Jesus did. They had a problem with who Jesus was. And who Jesus was, was he was Messiah. Are you understanding what I'm saying? The Muslim doesn't have a problem with what Jesus did. He will applaud the miracles. The Hindu doesn't have a problem with what Jesus did. But the moment you say that Jesus is the son of God, he is the one who forgives your sin, there is no way to heaven but through Jesus. The moment you say that, everybody has a problem. Red flags are flying. There is fouls called. There is objections made. They did not have a problem with what Jesus did. Oh, he was a prophet. He did good things. All that's great. But they had a problem with who he was and who he was was undeniably the son of God he was the Messiah and this is what I want to remind you guys today you know in verse number 8 the Bible says and straight away Jesus perceiving in his spirit that they so reasoned within themselves said to them why reason you these things in your heart Jesus comes out exposes their hearts Jesus is like man that's what you're thinking I'm going to expose you right now you should be lucky that Jesus doesn't minister to you and Ashish ministers to you on Sunday mornings. Otherwise, he'd be reading right through your heart right now and exposing everything you're thinking. He'd be like, uh, Justin, uh, you're not thinking about the message right now. You're thinking about the pizza you're going to have after service today. <coughs> Just kidding. But Jesus reads right to the heart, calls him out. That's why Mark gets... His passage from earlier in the verse in chapter number 7 where he talks about what is in their hearts, if y'all were wondering. In verse 9 in turn, the Bible says, which is easier for to say, the sick of a, uh, to say to the sick of the palsy, thy sins are forgiven, or to say, arise and take up their bed and to walk, right? Excuse me, he asked him the question in verse 10, right? That, but, but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic. So he asked them questions. He asked the, the, the scribes the questions. He poses a challenge and he totally ignores them and he answers the man instead. It's amazing to think about this, right? He may have never had the chance, right? L -l -l think about this man, right? This man has never walked. He has never had the chance to walk into the temple to offer a sacrifice for the remission of sins. 
Think about this man, right? This man who's been living under the old covenant. His parents would have probably gone to the temple, offered their sacrifices. But here's a man who was carried everywhere, never had an opportunity to go to the temple himself. But the Bible looks at him and says, the man ans- and Jesus looks at him and says, the son of man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Here's a man who can never go into the temple and ask God for forgiveness, never offer a dove, never offer a burnt offering, never offer a sacrifice in the remission for his sins. And today, for the very first time, Jesus is standing in front of him and saying, man, you never had the opportunity to ask for forgiveness of sins. But guess what? You're not living in that old covenant anymore. You're living in the new covenant. And man, what you could never have done before by your own ability, today you don't have to do through your own ability. I am going to do it for you. And he takes away his sin and he says, I forgive you of all your sins. And in verse number 11, he says, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed and go home. The amazing thing is this, he does not heal him first. He, he does not heal his physical inability first. He heals his spiritual inability first. Listen to me, church. Jesus cares about your soul more than he cares about your limp. He says he cares about your soul more than he cares about your physical disability. For a lot of us, Jesus is all about what he can do for us. But Jesus is like, man, I am all about what I can do inside of you. Everything, all I do for you is a result of what I do in you. And Jesus has to address the soul and address the spirit and address this person who is deeply needing Christ, who is deeply needing salvation. A man who could never leave his house to enter the temple, to be in the vicinity of the temple, who never had his own volition to get up and go and meet with God. A man who was probably confined to his bed for the whole of his life. For the very first time, he is having a spiritual encounter. And what better encounter than to look Jesus in his eyes and Jesus looking at him and saying your sins are forgiven Jesus more than anything else was concerned about that very moment when everybody was waiting for the healing Jesus was waiting for his heart to welcome him come on somebody this is good and the moment he does that he looks at him and says I did what I had to do first now I say to you rise pick up your bed and go home Notice that Jesus does not ask him to struggle. Uh, Jesus does not pick him by his hand. Jesus does not, uh, you know, uh, help him to rise up or limp, you know, or, 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 you know, carry his bed for him or push him out of the way. Nothing of that sort, right? He simply looks at him and says, man, I want you to rise. First thing is rise. The second thing is pick up your bed. And the thing, third thing is I want you to go home. Before Jesus did something for him, he wanted to do something in him. And once he had done that in him, Jesus looked at him and said, man, today is your day of miracle as well. There are two miracles that happened on that day, right? The miracle of salvation. Do you know that miracles happen every single time somebody accepts Jesus as their Savior and their Lord? It's amazing, right? Uh, Here's a man that was brought in on this stretcher, on this bed, and he's about to carry the same thing that he was carried in with. It's nothing short of a miracle. Uh, In verse number 12, go on to verse number 12, I'm about to close, and he rose and immediately picked up his bed went out before them all so that they were all amazed and glorified God saying, we never saw anything like this. This man held in his hand what held him up. That is a miracle. He left the door that he couldn't enter in the first place. Come on, somebody. The door that he couldn't enter, remember that, guys. The most obvious door of your miracle It's probably not going to be the door that you're going to walk through for your miracle. But it's probably going to be the door that you walk out of. Witnessing to everybody what Jesus did in your life. Right? Uh, He left through that door that he couldn't enter. 
in the front of the scorning eyes, in the front of the judgmental eyes, in the front of the eyes that were looking and looking down on him, right? What a, what a contrast to what the scribes were doing, right? The, the word translated is, is the word amazed, the word astonished. It, it, it's the meaning of being thrown into a, surpri- into a state of surprise or fear or both. That's what the word means. And everybody was surprised. They were astonished. You know, we may feel, you know, sometimes feel the same way when we encounter Jesus Christ or when we read God's word. Remember the man, uh, the, the people that saw the man that was deliv- delivered from legion or, or from those demons, how they reacted? They reacted with amazement is what the Bible says. But why? Did they think that, that you know, it was beyond God's power to save? Do we feel the same way when God saves certain people? Do we feel the same way when God heals people? Are we filled with awe? Are we filled with astonishment? Here's what I want you to know in. Eight legs walked in. Ten legs walked out. That, my friend, is a miracle. But what ignited the miracle were ten legs of faith. Ten legs that had faith that ignited the miracle. It wasn't the ten legs that walked in. It was the ten legs that walked out that was a testimony to what people saw. And they were astonished. They were, they were, they were in awe of what God was doing over there. The ten-legged miracle is when people looked in astonishment and said, man... All we saw was eight legs walking into this place. But the faith inside of this man propelled him to go to this place of healing. They all had to believe. Man, when you're believing for healing, it could be for a family member. There's probably somebody that's praying for a family member today. There's probably somebody that's praying for a friend of yours today. Man, I pray that you will go in with so much of yearning. That you you will go in with so much of faith. As we get into a time of prayer, as we get into a time of of worship right now, as we approach communion right now, I don't know how many of y'all are believing for a healing and a miracle in your life. But let me tell you something. There is power in the blood of Jesus. There is power in the blood of Jesus. Whatever your disability would be, get people around you that can walk into any situation. It could be two legs that walk with you. You might be too weak to fast and pray, but man, have two legs bring you in to the presence of God in fasting and prayer. Sometimes you carrying people are what you need. Is that is all that you need sometimes. Don't you know those people that can't do it by themselves and they need help, they need support. I pray that you will be those two legs that will bring them in. I pray that two legs that go into battle would result in four legs coming out of battle. Am I talking to somebody today? Remember those three men that were in the fire, that were thrown into the fire? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? There were six legs that walked into that fire. But listen to me. God doesn't leave you hanging. When you walk into situations in your life that you desperately need God, suddenly out of nowhere, eight legs appeared. And when late legs appeared, people saw that. They said, we, we threw only three men in there. But all of a sudden, we see another pair of legs. We see a fourth man. It's amazing when God intervenes, what happens. It's amazing what happens when you and I come into the presence of God and say, God, I have a thirst. Can you think of somebody that needs Jesus today? Go into the presence of God in fasting and prayer for that person today. I don't know what your situation is. I don't know who you're praying for. I don't know who you're interceding for. I don't know who it is that you're asking God for deliverance for today. But I need you to know something. It takes the faith of one man. It takes the faith of one Jairus. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Jairus didn't have his daughter. There were only two legs that approached the miracle. But remember what happened. The moment Jesus heals, 
the moment Jesus heals and raises Jairus' daughter, something amazing happens. The two legs of faith propels a miracle for an additional pair of legs to get up and walk in faith. Sometimes the person experiencing the miracle probably doesn't walk with you. But don't discount that they probably have the faith. Don't encourage them to have the faith. Tell them about what Jesus did. I'm imagining that Billy and Timmy and the other two friends actually told this guy, said, dude, I want to tell you about Peter's mother-in-law. I want to tell you about, I want to tell you about Lucas, who was demon-possessed, and this man was healed. Let me tell you about them. Come on, I want some people to fill some people up with words of inspiration, words of encouragement. Tell people about what God did in your life. Tell people about what God did in your situation. Tell God, tell people about the, the time that you almost died. Tell people about the time that you almost knew that you couldn't make it. Tell people about that time that you were going to commit suicide and you, you, something happened and God miraculously saved you. Tell people about that. Tell people about that pain that you went through and how God brought you out of that pain. Tell people about the miracles that you went through in your life that you experienced in your life because those miracles even though you walked in by yourself remember when you carry somebody in faith expecting a miracle God will say man the, the, the faith is so big the faith is so huge God can't help but honor your faith 10 legged faith is when not just the person expecting the miracle has faith, but he has a community of people of faith who are willing to gouge, who are willing to, to, to pry into the roof and do anything that they can, who are willing to go into the roof, make a racket, make a noise, be an embarrassment. People are going to look up and say, what's going on? But I don't care. It's my miracle. It's my healing. I don't care if I have to be put to shame. It doesn't matter. Today, it's about my healing and I'm going to take it by force. I don't know how many of y'all are believing for a miracle, but today, do not be ashamed about putting yourself through embarrassment for your own miracle. This man wasn't embarrassed that he was being lowered in his own bed. But what he didn't know is when he was done and over with, man, something was going to change in his life. But here's what I want you to know. Some of your friends need to experience miracles. Some of y'all need to experience miracles. But I pray that those miracles will be a result of you knowing Jesus first. Jesus said, guys, I know y'all want the miracle, but I got to first do what, what my father sent me for. Am I talking to somebody over here? And what I, what I was sent for and what my mission is, is that I have to raise dead people back to life. I, I have to go into the spiritually dead and I have to raise them back. So Jesus did not only want to heal, he wanted to first Come on, so you, you, you get my, catch the drift here. I pray that in all your yearning for miracles for people, I pray that you will care for their soul first. Look at people that need miracles in their life and say, do you know Jesus? Have you experienced Jesus? Do you know the power of Jesus? Because in the promo video, we talk about that. It's just not about what Jesus does. It's about who he is. He is almighty. He is sovereign. He is all powerful. Introduce people to that Jesus. Let them meet Jesus. Let them know of his goodness. Let them know of his wonderful nature. Let them know of his omniscience. Let them know of his omnipotence. Because there are always going to be people around to take objection to who Jesus is. But Jesus isn't going to compromise his message for a sign that people want to see. His miracles were not his message. Come on, some, are you understanding what I'm saying? His miracles were not his message. 
His message was you are dead in sin, in desperate need of me. He looked at that paralytic man and said, what you need is me. What you desperately need is for your soul to be saved. And when people raised objections and when people were murmuring in their hearts and and Jesus says, I know what you're thinking right now. But he canceled all those claims. And he said, for the Son of Man has come. Come on, somebody. He establishes his mission and he says, woe unto me if I don't preach and if I don't do what my Father in heaven has asked me to do. So first he takes the opportunity to look at him and say, hey, you be healed. Think about that. It wasn't a miracle crusade. Jesus didn't declare a miracle crusade in Peter's house. And as soon as they started praying, he didn't go lay hands on people and pray for them. What was he doing when they lowered him into the house? What was he doing? The Bible says he was teaching. Jesus always taught the word before he healed people. You know why? The Bible reminds us and says faith comes through what? Jesus' responsibility was to fill the hearts of people with what? Expectation. This is good. With faith. Because faith, according to Hebrews, is a substance of things not seen. This paralytic man has not seen, but man, when the word was preached, Jesus' mission on earth was to preach the, the good news, was to preach about his father to preach so that people will be saved. That's his first and, and uh, the biggest motive. And he said, man, these signs and wonders just follow that. It comes with the package. When you and I can experience Jesus in his fullness and you know who Jesus is in your life and my life, miracles flow. Miracles come with the package. You know, the Bible says, if you guys have your communion, I want you to grab your communion right now. I want you to take this moment wherever you are. I know we don't often do this, but stand up to your feet with me, wherever you guys are. We're going to take a moment to, you're going to be in your homes, it's okay, in your couches, take a moment, stand up with me. Get uncomfortable for a little bit. You know, I've heard numerous and numbers of number of stories where people walked into church in the presence of God, believing for a healing, believing for a miracle. The number of stories that I've heard of people expecting God to heal, and it was probably communion Sunday, and they believed that the broken body of Jesus and the blood of Jesus. was a reminder to them that there is healing and there is breakthrough through the blood of Jesus. Another one. Give me another one. As we approach this communion today, thank you. As we approach this communion today, I want this to be a reminder of who God is. Let this be a reminder today. You know, on the night Jesus was betrayed, they sat in what was called the upper room. The disciples, all of them sat together and there was going to be some bad news that Jesus was about to share with them. He said, guys, we're going to have a feast. We're going to have a meal together. But what they would ordinarily do, they would every day they would get together and have this meal at the end of the day. What they would regularly do is, is this meal that they would do. Jesus was about to break to them and say, guys, someone from among you is going to betray, betray me. One of y'all that have been walking with me for the last three years, one of y'all are going to betray me. And he took the, the bread that he would normally break. He took it in his hands. The Bible says he broke it. 
he gave it to his disciples. And he said, guys, my body is about to go through a similar breaking like this. I'm going to be led like a sheep that's going to be led to the slaughter. Many of y'all sitting over here are going to run away when that happens. He looked at Peter and said, Peter, you're going to betray me. You're not, you're, 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 sorry, not betray me. Peter, you're going to uh, give me up. Deny me, sorry. Deny me, that's the word. He says, he says you're, going to, you're going to deny me three times. And Peter was like, me, 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 Jesus? Yeah, you, Peter. One of you is going to betray me tonight. Ooh, everybody's looking at one another. Who's going to do it? But Jesus said, it doesn't matter. All that's irrelevant. What I really am focused on is for you to understand this. It's from this day onward, this will be a visible reminder of what's going to happen in the next coming days. Okay, I want you to hear this. What's, going to about, what's, what's about to happen in the next few days is going to be a visual reminder of what we're going to do right now. He said this bread is going to be a symbolic representation of what was going to happen on the cross of Calvary. They're going to drag me across the streets. They're going to beat me. They're going to bruise me. I'm going to lay on a cross dying. My body is going to be beaten. It's going to be scourged. I'm going to be whipped. But don't you worry. Because that's the plan of God. Because my body is going to be given up for you. For, for you. The Bible reminded us and he probably reminded them of Isaiah when he says, by his stripes we are all healed. It's because of those stripes that you and I are healed and we can experience that healing in our bodies today. What happened on that day on the cross was brutal, was gory, rated R. It was worse than the passion of the Christ could ever portray. But I'll tell you something. It was the greatest act of sacrifice that the world has ever seen. There is no religion, there is no skeptic that can comprehend that God would become man to only die on a cross for the sins of the whole world. But that's exactly what he did. He took the entire sin of the world on his shoulders when he put his body on the cross of Calvary. You and I are reminding ourselves of that big sacrifice when you and I partake of this bread. I want us to do a, a symbolic represent, representation today. I want you to break this bread, no matter how small or big it is. Go ahead and break it for me. Use your power and your muscle if you can. Just like this bread was broken, his body was broken. It was bruised. Split on the cross for your sin and my sin. For your sickness and my sickness. And the Bible says in that upper room, he lifted up that bread, he gave thanks, and he said, thank you. He said, thank you. And Father God, I thank you for this bread today. And I thank you for what this means to us as Christians and believers. This is a representation that you care for us, that you love us. That your stripes and your, your body that was beaten and scourged up to the cross of Calvary, the body that was poked and pr pried and the body that was pierced, it was pierced for me, God. Because I would never have to go through that again. The sicknesses and the ailments of this world are in no comparison to the physical decay that I would have to go through if I don't know you. I pray, God, that this will be a representation. It will be a significant representation of who we are in you. That we are saved. Our bodies are guaranteed to be in heaven. Lord, when we die, 
or when you take us up, whichever is first, we are guaranteed that we will be in your presence because we have a relationship with you because we understood what this, this body did for us. So we take that, we apply this into our lives. Thank you for what this means to us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Can we partake of this bread together? When the disciples were still debating and murmuring and wondering who was going to betray Jesus, When Peter was still in denial that he was going to deny Jesus. The Bible says, and then he took the cup. The Bible says he gave thanks like he always did. Jesus was thanking God for the worst that was about to happen. He was thanking God that his three years of ministry were going to come to a beautiful end And in that beautiful end, he knew that the weight and the sins of this world would be lifted up. There's some of y'all that need to make decisions in the presence of God today. Some of y'all that need Jesus more than anything in this world. Man, we all sin. We all fall short of the glory of God. Me included. And I take every opportunity I can when I come into the presence of the Lord. The Lord, the Bible tells us this. It says... This that we're partaking in is the new covenant. The representation of this cup is the new covenant remission for our sins. The blood that was spilt in the temple that looked at people and said, all your sins will be wiped away. When Jesus spilt his blood on the cross of Calvary, do you know what that blood was for? That blood guaranteed that you will not have to live in guilt and sin and shame anymore in your life. I don't know what guilt you're living in, brother, sister, whoever you are, however young, however old you are, no matter how grievous of a sin you've done, no matter how big or how small, it does not matter. Sin is sin. And I want to remind you that Jesus died for your sin. Give it into the hands of Jesus today. Give that lying nature into the hands of Jesus. Give that foul mouth into the hands of Jesus. Give that slanderous mouth into the hands of Jesus. Give that adulterous heart into the hands of Jesus. Give that heart of fornication into the hands of Jesus. Whatever it is that you're guilty of today, it could be gambling, it could be pornography. It could be sexual sin. Whatever it is, whoever's listening to me. It could be an affair. Whatever it is, church, I pray that you and I will be able to give it into the hands of Jesus and say, Jesus, there's nothing too big, nothing too small that you have not taken care of in the cross of Calvary. And I want to assure you today, there's nothing that Jesus hasn't heard about. He's seen it all. The Bible says he's seen it before the foundations of this earth were formed. And guess what? He knew that you were going to do what you did even before you knew it and even before you did it. And he said, I sent my son to die on it. And I'm taking extra time today because I feel in my heart that some of us need reconciliation today. Some of us need to make a decision right now, right today, right where we are, that you need to get it right before God. So I urge you today, get it right before God. The Bible reminds us that in Corinthians, examine yourselves before we partake of this. And before you partake of this, here is your opportunity. As somebody that doesn't know Jesus, he cares about your soul before he cares about your deliverance and your breakthrough. He 
He cares about your salvation before he cares about your promotion. He cares about your salvation before he cares about your healing. He cares about your salvation before he cares about all the things that you're praying for. He cares about your soul. Give that to him. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all these things shall be added unto you. So today there's somebody that needs to say, God, you have all of me. All of me. Just not a part, just not a little bit, but all of me. There's somebody that needs to get it right before God. Do it right now. Somebody that needs to resubmit your heart before God. Somebody that needs to, you know, just, just, just change your life upside down. It's not too late. It's, it is not too late. You think it is. You might, you might imagine that it is. You're like, oh, it's too, too long. I mean, I've, I've, I've been in this for such a long time. I don't think this turning around. It's never too late to make a 180 in Jesus. If he is for you. You can put your pride aside. Put all your inhibitions aside. Seek the face of Jesus today, right now, and God will deliver you. Resubmit your heart to God. There's somebody that doesn't know Jesus. Say this prayer after me. Dear Jesus, come into my heart. I wish to have a, a relationship with you. Be my king. Be my Lord. Forgive me of my sins. I am yours and you are mine. I accept you as my Lord and my Savior. Be king over my life. In Jesus' name, amen. That's all. If you said that short prayer, welcome into the kingdom of heaven. Welcome into the kingdom of heaven. Welcome. The Bible says the angels are rejoicing at this moment if you said that prayer. Some of y'all need to make rededications. And say, God, you know what? I've messed up. I've fallen. I've fallen along the road. There's stuff that's happened, God, I'm not proud of. But guess what, God? I know that it doesn't matter because you've seen it all. And today you care about my soul before you care about my miracle. And I want you to repeat after me, Jesus, forgive me. Come into my heart, Lord. I've replaced you many times. But today, I want to make you front and center of my life. I want you to fill my home and which ho the, the home that you fill when your presence is in me it crowds out everything else. So come back today. Take residence. Saturate my heart. Fill my heart. Forgive me. Thank you Jesus. And likewise he took the cup he gave thanks. He gave it to his disciples and said, this is my blood. Let this be a reminder to you that I am capable, I am able to wipe away the sins of all mankind. Father, we thank you for this cup, for what it represents. Upon this cup hinges the gospel that you came in the form of man, died on the cross. And now you are seated on the right hand of your Father, preparing a place for each one of us. We do this in remembrance of what you did on the cross, but not for too long. One day we would not have to do this anymore. We can't wait for that day. But till that day comes, I pray that we will stay faithful to what you have in store for us. We give you praise. We give you glory. In Jesus' name. Can we take this together, church? I want to remind everybody this day. There are so many of your friends. There are so many people on mats lying helpless that are in desperate need for Jesus that need to come and sit right next to you one day and experience what you experienced Janice they are desperately needing to experience what Jesus does in your life but they will never hear it unless and until you literally look at them and say you need Jesus come with me I gotta take you
And I can't wait for that day that we don't have to take this anymore. Jesus is coming soon, y'all. He is. I know it. He's coming soon. I don't know when, but he's coming soon. And I can't wait for that day where we will be taken up with him. I look forward to that day. But I pray that you will live in faith. This week, as we celebrate family, as we celebrate togetherness and thankfulness, and as we tell one another what we're thankful for, and as families come together all across America today, and this week, I pray that God will be the center of your homes. I pray that we will take time to reflect on the goodness of God. Amen. Can I pray for you guys, and can I send you guys? All right, close your eyes with me. Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you for what you've done. We thank you for your goodness, your love, and your mercy. As we come into your presence today, we just want to revel in your goodness. We want to revel in your presence. Thank you for what you did on the cross of Calvary. Thank you, Lord, because Jesus cares about my soul before he cares about my condition. He cares about my soul before he cares about my situation. He cares about my heart before he cares about my, 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 my environment. And today I might be seeking my breakthrough, but God is seeking my heart. And God, I pray, God, that you will, you will do your work in my heart before you do a work in my situation. We thank you because you're a good, good father. We thank you because you are king. We thank you because you are Lord. Do miracles that only you can do. We thank you and we praise you. All glory and honor be unto you. We give you praise. We give you glory. In Jesus' master, the mighty name we pray. Amen. May the Lord bless you. May he keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you. May he be gracious to you. May he lift his countenance your direction. Give you peace that passeth all understanding upon your family, upon your children, upon your grandchildren upon your job, upon your education, upon your finances, upon every situation, your sicknesses and your health, for now and forevermore. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for listening. We love bringing you the word on so many different platforms. We are so thankful for what God is doing in and through us. We'd love for you to subscribe so you don't miss out. And don't forget to share this message if it has blessed you.